everyone. Before I start my talk, I want to do a quick survey and see who I'm talking to. How many of you are the only developer on your team or in your department? All right, we've got a couple, good. How many of you are freelancers? Just a handful. Okay, great. Um, the rest of you guys know everything. You've learned from all your peers and coworkers. They've told you every mistake they've ever made along the way, right? All right, well then, we can all get a little bit of something out of this talk. I'm here to talk about mistakes I've made because I think being humble is pretty awesome as a developer. That's how I learn from other people, so I may need to do that today. My name is Laura Egan. I am relatively new to Vancouver. I've only been here about six months. I moved from Detroit, Michigan. Prior to that, I lived in Georgia and Indiana. I'm thrilled to be here. I am primarily a WordPress custom theme developer. I build uh, WordPress sites. Nine out of the 10 of my sites have no blog whatsoever, so I'm using WordPress as a CMS. I'm currently a founding partner of LLM Company, so I have made the leap from being solo freelance to being duo freelancers slash a company. Apparently that's what a company is. Um, we came up with a name and now I have an awesome co-developer. So I love it and really appreciate having um, somebody to bounce my ideas off of, somebody to um, keep me in check and help me check my code, right? Um, quick little visual on the work that I do. These are some sites that I've worked on recently. Um, typically small business sites. Um, like I said, I use WordPress as a CMS, so I'm not aiming to make it look like a blog by any means. What, is, what are mistakes? Well, experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes, right? So you start out as a junior developer and you haven't made mistakes yet. You don't have any experience. But eventually you, you make a lot of mistakes. Solo freelancers rarely get to see others making mistakes. This is the, the, our Achilles heel, right? We, we want to know, okay, well tell me, you know, how do I do this? I don't have a coworker, I don't have somebody at an elbow. Um, now I do, although she's long distance, but for the first six years that I was doing this solo, I didn't. Um, so that's, that's why I'm gonna share some of these mistakes. Um, I should preface this by saying that I consider myself somewhere in the intermediate level of development. Um, this talk will really um, probably resonate mostly with people who recently remember being a beginner developer. If you are a senior developer, then consider this talk a way to um, you know, walk down memory lane and remember what it really was like um, those first few years. Big mistake I'd make all the time, I trust my browser. Yeah, this looks really awesome in Chrome. And okay, I'm gonna check it in IE2. All right, now we're good to launch, right? Not so much. Um, lately, I've been using this awesome little tool in developer tools um, that allows me to preview what my responsive design will look like on mobile. I've highlighted it in that little uh, purple square. Great, awesome, I can see what my responsive website is gonna look like on an iPad, or on an iPhone, or on a Samsung, or on a Nokia, and um, I get kind of a preview. As it turns out, that preview has been lying to me, and I found that out through my clients who came back to me and said, yeah, we paid you to make our site responsive, and you showed us the staging site preview, and it looks like this one on the right. That's our desktop site. We paid you to make it responsive. And I'm like, yeah, my media queries, they're all there. No, it, it looks really great in my Chrome when I preview it. What am I missing? The viewport tag. Tiny little symbol, one line of code that I need to have at the top of um, my web page in order to tell the mobile device not to zoom out all the way and show me the desktop view. It's so simple, and of course, I only find out after the client emails me back and says, yeah, that doesn't look responsive to us. Two minutes later, I email them back and go, yeah, refresh your browser and try it again. I Googled it and found out about this thing. What's another issue that's coming up to me constantly because my browser is lying to me? Horizontal scroll. I don't want horizontal scroll, I only want vertical scroll. My mouse scrolls up and down, but what happens when you're on the actual mobile device? You can actually nudge the page a little bit to the left and the right, and then you find out that there's this white space that you had no idea about until you got out of your browser, off of your desktop computer, and onto the mobile device itself. So for many of you app developers, this is a no-brainer. You're gonna go grab the device and you're gonna 
testing on the device. For me, as a developer, that is still a leap that I'm constantly pushing myself to do. You gotta, you know, get out of the house and go down to the cell phone store. You gotta go try out every device that they have and see what it looks like on every single actual device. Why? Because those were just two issues. These are other common issues. Touch. You need to see how the actual touch-enabled device works. Um, everything loads slower on mobile. Even with a Wi-Fi connection, everything loads slower. Things flicker. I've had uh, something that I, I had never seen the entire time I'm developing, and then it flickered between page loads, and the client found it, and I didn't, of course. Big mistake. Um, there are differences between the different browsers on mobile, so when you're just saying mobile, you might be thinking Safari and your client's looking at Chrome and you're like, hey, I don't see the same bug as you. Sorry, I can't recreate it. It doesn't exist. Might be a totally different browser on their mobile device. So that was mistake number one that I'm constantly making. Number two, I edited code in the WordPress editor. Don't do this. It's, it's one of those 101 things, but when you first get started out with WordPress, you get the logins to the site and you're like, all right, I found the PHP. I'm good to go. Let's edit. No, because soon you'll find the white screen of death, or you will edit functions.php, and you will lock yourself out of the admin, which is no thrill. So what you really want is all the access um, to the site itself, whether that's through SFTP or SSH. You really want to make a copy of those files and start working locally. Work in your text editor. I use Sublime Text. I hear a lot about brackets, but I have a little blank there. Shout out if you use an awesome code editor and you think we should know about it. Okay, we're all using Sublime Text, I guess. Vim? All right, tricked out Vim. All right. Version control. Who's using anything besides GitHub and Bitbucket for version control? Uh, no, let's say Dropbox. Dropbox. Ooh. <laughs> What, what did you say in the back? Mercur mercurial. Ooh, tongue twister. Good. So I, I left these blanks because I don't know everything and I'd really love to learn from you even as I'm standing up here in front of you talking. Big mistake I've made. My very first web development gig, I just you know, worked for a studio and was the only person who did web development and they had launched 100 sites before I came in. So what did I do on, you know, day three? Oh, here's the logins to this production site. Go and, you know, edit that thing on the home page. Then that happens. Because I'm editing in production, the whole world can see my site. And the worst, of course, that can happen is um, the client sees the thing, well, or the public sees the thing, and I have to write an email apology and tell them, hey, by the way, don't look at your site right now because I broke something, but I'm working on fixing it. I think I've shaved years off of my life because of editing in production and the stress associated with it. Um, this is what you want to be doing. You do want to be editing on a staging site, and then they look like these perfect little twin planets, and you are only changing the one that is not publicly accessible or visible, and eventually, when you're happy with the changes there, you move them over to, to production. That is something that many of you developers know, but as a solo person, I had to learn that the hard way. It was rough. Um, where do you put this staging site? Depending on the client, I might be running a local copy. I might be running it as a subdomain on production, or occasionally I want to do it on my own server. Um, some people just feel more comfortable having their own files that they're working on um, not be in the client's hands. Um, there's, there are advantages and disadvantages to all of these. The local copy is the only one you do not have to worry about password protecting. The other two, they're on the web. You want to be sure that nobody's stumbling upon those. Mistake number four. I did only what the client asked for because I'm just here to serve, right? They want a website, I build a website. They want a new page on their site, I build a new page on their site. They want a new design, I do it. Um, that's a huge problem because there are silent questions they are not asking me. These are some that I come across, but there are so many more. Um, clients don't ask me what other logins I need. They just give me the WordPress logins, the SFTP, okay, great. I'm, I'm good to go. But what if I did need to get a hold of their Google Analytics or what if I needed to connect them to a third-party service? I probably want that on day one because um, when I do need that, it might be because I broke something and I want to fix it as soon as possible. 
so might as well ask for it on day one. Redirects, that's like an unspoken request that's part of the value that I add as a developer. I should be keeping in mind that the old site had a different URL structure, and I need to have all of my redirects in place before launch. Clients don't ask about that, and when they do, it's a disaster scenario because they noticed it. Are you using version control? Haven't had a client ask me that yet, but I do need to be thinking about it. Things like analytics and generating a sitemap are SEO concerns that, that we all want to be keeping in mind. Those are mistakes if we don't do them. And lastly, haven't had a client ask if they could keep me on a retainer for maintenance, but it's a question that I definitely want to make sure that they ask eventually. Um, I was cheap. When you get started with WordPress, you're like, hey, it's open source, there's all this free stuff. Um, if you have gone down that path, you'll realize that eventually that means things break and are unsupported and, uh, you know, in the worst case scenario, there's some bug and your site got hacked. Um, this is an example. I had a client who wanted me to add on a slider. Uh, this slider pulled from a custom post type that I had already created, so I thought, no problem, I can do this. I quoted how many hours it would take me, and then I got into it, and it was, you know, all of a sudden that cool jQuery script I was planning to use didn't work the way that I wanted it to, so I had to hand code it. It was a total nightmare, and I remember sending it to the client and being like, okay, it's good to go, and they clicked through the whole thing, and it didn't restart. It, didn't, it wasn't a full carousel, so the last slide wasn't the same as the first, and, and the widths were off, and, you know, it wasn't perfect, and I had to scratch it and start over again. So great, I hand-coded this several times. What did I really need to do? I needed to look into the premium plugin that had that built into it, and that fixed my problem in less than three hours. Um, so I've talked myself now into investing in the right plugins. I get to um, get a lot of value out of something for a little bit of money, um, but I'm charging my clients anyway, and my time is valuable, so why not? These are the paid plugins that I love and use constantly. Um, they're pretty popular, so you may have heard of them before. Gravity Forms, Advanced Custom Fields, WooCommerce Extensions, ShipStation, Royal Slider. Who's got a favorite paid plugin? What tool are you paying money for that you're like, yes, everybody should buy this one? Yeah. Advanced Custom Fields, yes. It's, it's great. I actually just went to a WordCamp and they were talking about um, how ACF was okay. They're saying version control is kind of an issue with it. That, that you know Everybody can go in and edit it and it's on the database, so they wish they could version control better. Um, but I hear that people are doing it straight up with PHP, uh, which I'm like, hey, ACF saves me that whole headache of having to hand code it. So. Um, those are my rambling thoughts about ACF, but I do love it because it turns WordPress from one field, assuming it's gonna be a blog post, right, into any amount of content fields that you want, um, whether those are email fields or whether those are uh, validated for a bunch of different things, date, um, they're pretty awesome. I love advanced custom fields. What else? Um, Backup Buddy, I don't list on here, but it's it's a handy one. You pay for it and it helps you create those uh, staging sites. So you can quickly zip up your entire site and relaunch it elsewhere without having to get too much into MySQL. This is a website that when I started off um, working for this client, they had a PayPal button on the page and that's how they sold their product. And very quickly I moved them over to WooCommerce and that just helped them get started with, okay, we're gonna actually have a checkout page rather than a PayPal button. But this proved to me how worth it it was to have paid plugins because just having WooCommerce on their site allowed me six months later when they wanted to start taking Amazon payments and credit card payments and when they wanted to start managing shipments through their website, I just added those as extensions and you know it cost them a little bit each time as a paid extension, maybe one's 80 bucks, maybe one's 150 but saved me a ton of headaches because if I had stayed with an open source free e-commerce plugin, I would not have had um, those extensions available to me. I would have been hand coding every um, addition to that site. Mistake number six, I said yes instead of no. My entire career as a freelancer was built on saying yes. Somebody came to me and said, I have this problem, I need a web page to solve it, and I said yes, and you know, that, that was, what I did every day, so the concept of saying no is difficult for me to adjust to, 
but I really believe now that it's so important to understand that you can say no. You have to refer them to somebody who has the skill set and time to handle the project. Two separate things. The skill set alone, yes. If I have somebody come to me and they want Shopify, I'm comfortable doing a certain amount of Shopify stuff. I've done a couple, but if, if I can tell right off the bat that it's not for me, that just isn't the right learning opportunity for me at this point in time. Um, I'd rather stick to the things that I specialize in, so I'm going to refer that to somebody else. And the time, if you hear the client talk about the kind of commitment they're looking for and it's not you, refer them on, they'll appreciate it. And just because I know WordPress doesn't mean that's going to be the right CMS for every client of mine, so um, fill in the blank there. It doesn't necessarily make it the best tool for the problem. Lastly, trust your gut, whether that's about the client or whether that's just about the project in general or, or the timing. Um, just say no. I think it's, it's a really powerful word to use as a freelancer. So those are mistakes I've made. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Any quick questions before we move on? Those were only the mistakes that would fit in 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you.